I just read that uh, uh, Israel right now is readying their air force to uh, retaliate. Of course, they've got the F-35. They've got the F-15, I think, the F-16. These are all obviously U.S.-built planes. Um, I don't think any of the missiles got through. I know there's shrapnel that hurt a young girl. I haven't heard of any other casualties. Have you? Okay. Uh-huh. You know, it's it's interesting that I was listening to a podcast by a guy by the name of Dan Senior. He's been on uh, a lot of networks. He uh his I think grandparents or his parents, probably his grandparents were survivors of the Holocaust. And uh he had some experts on from Israel on this podcast and he was saying that you notice how even people like Thomas Friedman of the New York Times, who's Jewish, he would say things like, yeah, Israel needs to pull back. Israel uh, can't go overboard. If we could just get rid of Netanyahu, everything would be all right. Well, in this podcast, he said Tom Friedman was saying that 20 years ago about a different Israeli leader. It's the same script. All the time, Israel has to moderate, Israel has to pull back, and it's like they think if we could just get a new leader, everything would be all right. Seemingly ignoring that Hamas, in their charter, basically says we need to kill all Jews. It has nothing to do with land. In the charter, it says uh, all of these conventions we have about land and all this, they're just a waste of time. In fact, if Israel were to give up all the land and all the Jews were to move to Vermont, Hamas would want them dead in Vermont. It has nothing to do with land. As you know, Palestine has never been a country. Palestine was a name given to the area by the 135 A.D. Emperor Hadrian, who, as we'll see in tonight's lesson, did a lot to actually preserve Christianity, even though he was trying to get rid of it. There's never been a Palestinian land. Palestine was just a name given to that area in order to prevent the Jews from laying claim to a land they had already laid claim to 15, 1800 years prior to that. So it's it's... Ridiculous, and by the way, every U.S. president has gotten this wrong. Every U.S. president has said, oh, yeah, we could just find a two-state solution. Everything would be solved. There is no two-state solution. The other side doesn't care about a state. It has nothing to do with land. It has to do with killing Jews. Hamas is the modern-day Nazi party. And these people online who are trying to say that Israel is in the wrong and Israel is committing genocide and all this, they don't understand history. They don't understand what's going on. This doesn't, of course, mean that everything Israel does is right. We're all fallen. We all need a savior. We all do things wrong on occasion. But in this conflict, it's not Israel that's saying all the Palestinians must die. It's, it's Hamas saying all the Jews must die. That's really what's going on. Go ahead, Reggie. Yeah. Yeah, you know, part part of the problem is, as we all know, Joe Biden is suffering from some mild form of dementia. And uh, it's not really his fault. He is where he is. His family put him up to this. In fact, there was a guy in WBT um, here locally, a talk show guy. I don't know his name, but he said, in November, we have a choice between orange man or a cadaver. <laughs> That's basically what he said. In any event, 
Uh, who knows what Biden is thinking, if he's thinking at all. Who knows what his advisors are saying. Although this, as you just said, Terry, has kind of tilted it back toward Israel. But when another country, unprovoked, sends a bunch of cruise missiles and drones at you, what are you supposed to do? Well, we'll see. We'll see what's going to happen. I'm sure people are going to ignore the facts and they're just going to say, Israel has to moderate. Israel needs to pull back. It was John Bolton, who's the former UN, uh, UN ambassador, said Israel ought to hit them disproportionately in order to say, you can't do this to a sovereign country. You can't do that to us. We're not going to tolerate that. So we'll see what happens. Pray for the peace of Israel, as Psalm 120, or Jerusalem, as I think Psalm 122 says. So we need to pray. And later on, for those of you that are tuning in online, we'll get to prayer later. But what we do is we go through a little bit lesson here, and then we have some commentary, some questions. And what we're doing is we're going through digging up the Bible. This is lesson 18. We're trying to go through the top archaeological discoveries in the Bible. We're going chronologically. This is our big picture of the entire Bible from creation all the way to eternity. And uh, in the first 16 lessons, we covered the Old Testament period, which covers creation to about 400 B.C. We talked a little bit about the intertestamental period from 400 B.C. to 1 A.D. Now we are in the New Testament period, which covers about 100 or so years. And last time we were in Lesson 17. And what we started is by asking the question, does archaeology support what the Gospels say about Jesus? His birth, baptism, and ministry beginning. His later ministry, where he walked and taught, and then his crucifixion and resurrection. And last time we covered some of point A and a little bit of point B. Let's just review what we did last time. We talked about Jesus' birthplace, Bethlehem, the archaeological uh, discoveries related to that. Also, the slaughter of the innocents in Bethlehem. We also talked a little bit about Jerusalem. We talked about Nazareth, Jesus' hometown. We talked about Jesus' baptism in the Jordan. And then we talked about where Jesus started to do his ministry. Cana was his first miracle, turning water into wine. We also talked about Jacob's well, the woman at the well, and a little bit about the Sea of Galilee. And if you guys really want to get into this, we're cruising at 30,000 feet, but the guy that goes into depth on this is Titus Kennedy, Dr. Titus Kennedy, an archaeologist. He's got three books now, Unearthing the Bible, Excavating the Evidence for Jesus, and the brand new one, which has to do with the Archaeological Guide to Bible Lands. And we just had him on a couple of weeks ago talking about seven archaeological discoveries associated with the life and death of Jesus. In fact, we'll talk about that probably next time we're in here. That had to do with the uh, crucifixion. In fact, there have been seven characters found in the dirt that had something to do with the crucifixion of Jesus. And we'll get to that, as I say, next lesson. So uh, one a uh, thing we didn't get to talk about last time in point A, his birth, baptism, and ministry beginning, has to do with Luke. If you have a Bible, let's go to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. And here's what Luke says regarding a census. He says, in those days, verses 1 and 2, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And then in parentheses, it says this was the first census that took place uh, while, now I'll get to why this says or before in a minute, uh, Quirinius was governor of Syria. Now, for many uh, moons, archaeologists and historians have said Luke has made an error here. And the reason they say he's made an error here is because this guy was governor in about 6 A.D. And if Luke is saying that the census that uh, he's talking about here occurred at Jesus' birth, that's why they had to go to Bethlehem to be counted, he's about a decade too late. All right? This census was 
after Jesus was born, not before. And it all hinges on a Greek word that either means while or it could mean before. Now, if I were to say to you, the attack on the World Trade Center is the one before 9-11. Was there an attack on the World Trade Center before 9-11? Yeah, it happened in 1993. Some Muslim tried to blow up the World Trade Center in the basement. I don't know if you remember that. Okay, so that's, what, eight years prior to 9-11? That could be, and it's unclear what Luke is saying here. It could be when he says this was the first census that took place before Quirinius was governor of Syria. And if that's the case, the problem is solved. So scholars still debate this, but we'll leave that aside because we want to talk about this guy right here. Is there evidence this guy existed? And for that, we got to go to Beirut, Lebanon, which at the time, Beirut was actually part of Syria. Okay? And this is where this guy was the governor. And they found in 1967 this inscription that actually has his name on it. And this is actually a sort of a eulogy in, in stone. And uh, this speaks of this gentleman who was, I guess he died in 54, and it says, Secundus, a Syrian military officer, is celebrated in this epitaph, which is a memorial stone akin to a eulogy, discovered in ancient Syria, which is modern-day Lebanon, and it says that he carried out a census under the provincial ruler of the Syrian governor Quirinius, who lived from 51 B.C. to 21 A.D., whose orders came from Caesar Augustus. Now, the Romans actually did censuses, if that's the plural for it, or is it census? I don't know. What's the plural for censuses? Does anyone know? Any English majors out there? Sensei? Is it sensei? I don't know. It's like, uh, who is it? Uh, Brian Regan, who says uh, oxen. Right? So if you have multiple boxes, why don't you call it boxing? <laughs> right? I don't know. But in any event, they did apparently censuses every 14 years. Now, how long would it take to do a census? A long time. So what's the biblical significance of finding this guy in the dirt and the fact that Josephus, a writer from the first century, a Jewish writer, talks about this census? But Josephus appears to be talking about the one that occurred in 6 AD, while Luke is talking about the one that occurred 14 years earlier in 8 BC. In other words, the details broadly support the date, 8 BC, 8 BC that this census at Jesus' birth took place. You go, wait a minute, 8 BC? That's at least four years too early. What's the answer to that? You just gave it. The census would take years to complete. So in about 4 BC, that's when Joseph and Mary head to Bethlehem to be counted in the place of their birth. So depending on whether this Greek word means while or before, and there's precedent for it meaning before, if it means before, there's no problem. All right? And given the fact that Luke has been tested in so many areas, as we'll see here in a future episode, it's kind of hard to disagree and say that Luke has committed an error here because he probably didn't. All right. All right. So now let's go to his later ministry where he walked and taught which area of or which city of Israel did Jesus do more of his miracles than anywhere else. Does anyone know? Capernaum. Let's go. This is why it's my favorite spot in Israel. If you ever get to go to Israel, you'll definitely go to Capernaum. And uh, Capernaum is on the Sea of Galilee. So this is to the north now. And Jesus probably spent 70, 80% of his time up in this area. Of course, he was born in Nazareth, but he then uh, made his home during his ministry in Capernaum. 
Now, what does Capernaum look like now? This is what it looks like now, aerial shot. And you go, the Millennium Falcon has landed <laughs> in Capernaum. How did that happen? Well, we'll get to it in a minute. When you go through over here, you're coming into Capernaum, this entrance here. They have this sign, Capernaum, the town of Jesus. And uh, this is up in the Sea of Galilee area on the northwestern side. This is a synagogue we'll talk about in a minute. And this is the church built over what archaeologists say was Peter's house. Now, there's a lot that went on in this town. In fact, Jesus made this his home. Matthew says, and leaving Nazareth, he went, leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea. So Jesus is making Capernaum his hometown. And since he lived there, he did a lot there. In fact, here are miracles that the Gospels say Jesus did in or around Capernaum. He heals a demon-possessed man. I'm just going to go through them now, then we'll comment on them. He heals Peter's mother-in-law in Peter's house. He heals the paralytic let down through the roof. You all know that story. They couldn't get in. There were too many people around, so these guys dug out the roof which was probably a thatch roof, and lowered him down in there so he could get to Jesus. He heals a man with a paralyzed hand. He calms the storm on the Sea of Galilee, just off the coast here. He heals the woman who was hemorrhaging blood. He heals Jairus' daughter. That's the synagogue leader's daughter. He heals the centurion's servant. He also heals a royal official's son in Capernaum while he was in Cana. So he's miles away in Cana, and he tells this royal official, your son is healed. And by the time he got to Capernaum and found his son healed, he realized that the time Jesus told him that is when the witnesses said the kid got better. He walks on water, and then the boat arrives immediately on shore on, the, on its way toward Capernaum. He puts a temple tax coin in a fish's mouth. He says, Peter, just pull a fish in. There'll be the temple tax for me and you in its mouth. And it was. And then he sends 153 fish into the nets of Peter. Who would have made this number up? 153. But it sounds like a fisherman, right? You're going to brag about that. We got 153. After we were fishing all night and we got nothing, we see Jesus on the shore and he says, put the net on the other side. And he, he, he brings in 153 fish. Now, I want you to notice something. The earliest gospel that most scholars say is the earliest gospel is Mark. They think that's the earliest. And some will say, well, Jesus never really claimed to be God in Mark. Okay. Now, of course, he does in Mark claim to be God when he's before the high priest in Mark 14. When the high priest asks him, are you the son of man? Are you the Messiah? And he, he says, I am. That's the holy name. That's the name of Yahweh. And you will see the son of man coming with great power on the clouds. And that's when Caiaphas tears his robe and says, blasphemy. So he does claim that. But notice what Mark does, the way he arranges his gospel. He actually shows Jesus as God by the stories he tells. Look at Mark 1. He heals a demon-possessed man. He has power over sickness and over demons. And also in Mark 1, he heals Jesus' mother-in-law. In Mark 2, he heals the paralytic through the roof. And he does this on the Sabbath. And what do the Pharisees say? You're not supposed to heal on the Sabbath. He, of course, refutes that. And then he says, your sins are forgiven to the guy, right? And what, what all the people around him say? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Well, that's right. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Implication? He's God, okay? He heals the paralyzed man in Mark 3. In Mark 4, he calms the storm. Last time we talked about that echoes Psalm 107, if you read Psalm 107, you see a psalmist talking about the fact that Yahweh gets in the boat and calms the storm. 
Well, here in Mark, Yahweh is in the boat. It's Jesus. And he calms the storm. Now, we need to say this because this is very prevalent in American Christianity. I understand how hard it is to come up with a new sermon every week. But pastors love to spiritualize the text. For example, they'll get to this passage and they'll say, Jesus, calm the storm. And as long as you have Jesus in your boat, he can calm the storms in your life. Is that, the, is, is that what's going on here? No. They're, 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 they're basically spiritualizing the text. This is an historical event, although it does have other implications. Jesus is able to calm the storm. Why is he able to calm the storm? What are the four things that hurt human beings? One of them is nature. What else? Sickness or disease. Sin. And finally, taxes. Thank you. Yeah, that's, it's taxes that kill us. <laughs> it's death, right? Now, if you think of Jesus' miracles, his miracles were in those four categories. He's sinless. He has power over nature. He can calm the storm, turn water into wine. He has power over sickness. He can heal people, and he can raise people from the dead, including himself. So through his actions, he's saying he's the Messiah. He can fix the four problems we have. Sin, nature, sickness, and death. So this is demonstrating that he's God. Because he has power over nature. That's the moral of this story. Also, go back to this one. He heals a paralytic let down through a roof. What might that make you think of? He's down. The paralytic's coming down. They have to dig up the roof so they could put him down where Jesus is. He's basically, as some say, it's showing, now this really happened, but it's showing that Jesus can heal somebody and bring back somebody who is sick and may be near death. Jesus is in the grave, and he can heal somebody so they can walk out. It's imagery that... They have to dig the roof up, like digging a grave up, and they can see Jesus as the Savior in the house who can heal the guy who may be sick and near death. My friend Dr. Chip Bennett has found a lot of these, this imagery in the New Testament that's showing that there's more to the story. Now, do you have to see that in order to know what the text means? No, he still has power over sickness. But you would expect, if this is the word of God, there would be all sorts of intricacies to it that you might not notice at first glance. Now, if all these miracles are done in Capernaum, why don't many in Capernaum believe? How often have you heard people say, well, if Jesus or if God would just do a miracle, I would believe. Is that really true? What does the history of the scripture show? It doesn't convince everybody, does it? Because quite frequently, people are not wanting to believe. It's not a lack of evidence. It's not about the evidence for the existence of God. It's more about the evidence of their resistance to God. They don't want God to exist. In fact, Peter Atkins, who is a Oxford-trained biologist, in fact, I think he may, tr he may uh, teach at Oxford and has debated Christians before, including William Lane Craig, was asked recently, what kind of evidence would convince you that Christianity is true? In fact, the interviewer said, what if Jesus would appear to you? What would you do? He'd say, I'd see my psychiatrist. He would just dismiss it as an hallucination of some kind. There's no evidence that would convince him. But here's what Jesus said about these cities. And there's other cities, as you'll see here, that 
he talks about. This is from, I think, uh, Matthew 11. Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Here's what he said. Woe to you, Chorazin, which is right up the hill from, from uh, Capernaum. Woe to you, Bethsaida, which is just a couple miles away. We'll see that here in a minute. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it would be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, Will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. And then in Luke 12, he talks about to whom much is given, much will be required. Now, this should be a wake-up call for us, ladies and gentlemen, because out of all the times in human history, we have more resources to know about Jesus and about God than at any time in history, and we're kind of, eh, no hum. I mean, can you imagine on your phone, you have access to the greatest libraries and the greatest evidences in the world, and most people are going, I don't care. There's, yeah, there's a lot of distractions, but who's responsible? We're not really seeking God. Most of us are looking for God like a criminal's looking for a cop. We're not interested. We're more interested in watching the next Netflix series than really searching out the scriptures. Now, in Capernaum, there is a synagogue, as I mentioned. This synagogue is actually a third or fourth century, I think it's a fourth century synagogue, built over the one that Jesus actually spoke in. Of course, you can go in it. This is my son and I, my youngest son. This is about 10 years ago in Capernaum. And on the side of this synagogue, it actually says, the late fourth century A.D. white synagogue built upon the remains of the synagogue of Jesus. You see this basalt, this dark colored rock? That was very common in the first century, and archaeologists are saying this was the original synagogue, and when that went down, they built another one on top of it. And as we said a minute ago, this is where it is. You can see it aerially, and uh, the, Matthew records that there are some healings at Peter's house under the Millennium Falcon. We'll talk about that here in a minute. Here's what Matthew says. It says, when Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she got up and began to wait on him. When evening came, remember that phrase, when evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. So if the archaeology is right, Jesus was in the synagogue teaching, then he went into Peter's house, and he healed Peter's mother-in-law, and then the word got out, and when evening came, a whole bunch of people showed up and wanted to be healed as well. Now, here is the question. Why wait until evening to be healed? I mean, Jesus was often on the move, right? If you're in that town, and you know Jesus is in town, and he's healing people, I wouldn't wait till evening, right? I would, I'd, I'd, go, I'd go find him right now, wouldn't you? You don't want him to leave, and then you might miss an opportunity. Well, here's an instance where another gospel writer tells us a detail that the first gospel writer didn't tell us, and it corroborates the two accounts and solves a problem. This, these are called undesigned coincidences, in other words, one writer inadvertently, without designing it, helps amplify what another writer said and solves the problem that maybe another writer created inadvertently. And this is the situation here. We're, asked, we're scratching our heads when we read Matthew's account going, why would anybody wait till evening? Well, here's Mark's account. Mark gives us a detail that Matthew doesn't. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came... That's when all this took place. It was the Sabbath. So that explains why people didn't immediately go to Peter's house to get healed. They had to wait. 
And uh, there are many of these undesigned coincidences, like eight or nine years ago when we went through Stealing from God in here in the book Stealing from God, uh, we have a bunch of these undesigned coincidences which show that they couldn't have invented this. There's no way to invent these minor details corroborating one another, even if they were trying to do this. It, 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 it doesn't make any sense that this is invented. That's why they're called undesigned coincidences. Now, churches were built over Peter's house. This is before they put the Millennium Falcon on Peter's house. This is what it looked like. And the center of this was the, or near the center was the original church. In fact, here's an aerial view. And how do we know that this was Peter's house? This is what they built. The Roman Catholic Church built this in 1990. And when you go into this, and you can go in there, the, the reason it's shaped that way is because when they built these octagonal churches in the Byzantine period, uh, they had these eight sides, and so they kind of built a big observatory on top of it, and there, the floor is plexiglass. So you can go in there and look down and see the original spot where Peter supposedly had his house. And uh, how do we know it's his house? Well, first of all, it's found near the sea. It's 90 feet from the synagogue, and it's under a Byzantine-era church, a couple of them actually, between the 4th and 6th centuries, discovered in 1968, by the way. The central hall is a residential structure converted about 50 A.D. to a meeting space consistent with a house church. So right about 50 A.D., this is uh, Jesus is, is risen from the dead in about 33 A.D. Of course, they can't be as precise. Maybe this happened in 34 A.D. We don't know, okay? But say in about 50 A.D., they converted this thing. And it's the only building in town with plaster walls. So they turned it from a residence into a meeting place. There were found 196 pieces of graffiti, including Lord Jesus Christ Peter and visiting pilgrim names. Now, most of these inscriptions came after 200 A.D., but here's what the Biblical Archaeological Society says. And these people aren't always conservatives, by the way, but here's what they say. The building's key role in understanding how Christianity began was confirmed by more than 100 graffiti scratched into the church's walls, most saying things like, Lord Jesus, help thy servant, or Christ have mercy, written in Greek, Syriac, or Hebrew, and are sometimes accompanied by etchings of small crosses, or in one case, a boat. Now, what's the biblical significance of this? Well, Here's a site converted and venerated in the first century that displays exactly what the gospel writers say. First of all, Peter had a house in a fishing town known as Capernaum. He's a fisherman, of course. Secondly, a first century synagogue was there too. Capernaum was busy. Why? Because it was on the road between Egypt and Damascus. So if you're going from Egypt and you're going to Syria, Damascus, you're going to pass right by this spot. Even if you wanted to go to Europe, you would pass right by this spot. Might be the reason why Jesus picked it. So the word about what he said and did could be spread by people passing through. Who else might be found in a town like this? Which disciple became a disciple from this town? Does anyone know? Yeah, Matthew. This would be a logical place for a tax collector. Because you got all people coming through. So the Romans would put him there to make sure they could get the proper taxes that people owed. So all this fits Capernaum, my favorite spot in Israel. Now, let's just go a few miles away to Bethsaida. Bethsaida was uh, a place where both Philip, Andrew, and Peter were from. That's what John says. Now, We'll see here that this is where Peter was born, but he later appears to have moved just a few miles away to Capernaum. Now, where is this place? Okay, we were just here in Capernaum. There are two tells. You know, a tell is uh, kind of a mound of debris. People keep building on the same spot, so it keeps getting higher and higher. And for years, people thought this tell, et tell, was the place of the biblical Bethsaida. In recent years, and recent meaning the past 10 years, 
it looks like this spot, El Araj, if that's the way we pronounce that, is the true Bethsaida. Now, what happened in Bethsaida? A, a famous miracle. The feeding of the 5,000 took place in Bethsaida. This is actually a still from the TV show, The Chosen. Now, when they actually filmed this, they got 10,000 extras. I think it's being filmed in Texas, if I'm not mistaken, right? <laughs> so they got, they got 10,000 extras. These are it's not CGI. And uh, he fed the 5,000. Now, how do we know that this is probably the biblical Bethsaida? This guy is an archaeologist, Stephen Notley from Nyack College, and he's been digging there a while. And why they think this is the real site is because it's close to the sea. The other tell is about a mile away. So why would you have a fishing village a mile away from the lake or the sea? It's called the Sea of Galilee. It's really a lake. It's a big lake, okay? Uh, and some say, well, maybe, you know, it was uh, the water was higher up. That's possible, but you don't find in this tell, El Tell, what you find at this site because this site is at sea level and the other one is 20 to 30 feet too high. There's evidence of a fishing village because fishing weights were found at this site, but not at the other site. Also, the Church of the Apostles is here. And this church is the traditional location of St. Peter's house. So we got a house in Capernaum for Peter. That's where he apparently moved to. But where his original house was, where he grew up, where he was from, was Bethsaida. And uh, the coin he appeared to be holding here may have been this Neronian coin. It was minted during the reign of Nero, who reigned from 54 to 68, and it was found at this dig site, and it shows, therefore, that this was being used in the first century. What is the Church of the Apostles? Well, Notley and I guess others have uncovered some amazing mosaics in this area. And uh, these mosaics point out that, first of all, the tradition says this was built on Peter's home, this church. And it maybe was his original home, or maybe it was his brother Andrew. Because, you know, Peter had a brother Andrew, who was also a, an apostle. And uh, Peter sometimes stayed there, perhaps. We're not exactly sure. But there are written requests for Peter to intercede for them. And one of the mosaics has a, de uh, a dedicatory prayer to St. Peter. So this goes all the way back to the first century. This appears to be the biblical Bethsaida, as best we know. Do we know for absolutely sure? No. That's what archaeology is, right? Sometimes it's hard to nail it down with certainty. But this appears to be a better candidate than the one that's a mile away. All right. Now, stay on the Sea of Galilee. Let's go to Magdala. What does that make you think of? Mary Magdalene. This is where Mary was from. And this is a synagogue that we'll get to in a minute. But where is this? Okay, we were just over here in Bethsaida. Here's Capernaum. Here's Magdala. Now, when you're touring the Sea of Galilee, this is like a four-minute bus ride, okay? It's right there. And uh, they found this synagogue back in 2009, I think it was, and at least 12 synagogues have been found from the time of Jesus in the Holy Land. Now, a synagogue typically was a place that you would go to because you couldn't get to Jerusalem, right? That's where the temple was. So this is kind of the next best thing. You'd go to a synagogue. And uh, Jesus, when he's in Jerusalem berating the Pharisees, who, by the, way, by the way, were the politicians of his day, they were on the Sanhedrin, to whom Rome delegated day-to-day -day legal, legal making authority. They were the politicians, and Jesus went after these people. Yes, Jesus was involved in politics, the politics of Israel. He excoriated these people, and here's one of the things he said. He says it in Matthew 23. He said, then Jesus said to the crowds and his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. Moses' seat. What's that? It was found in the synagogue in Magdala. 
this thing right here, and there's a replica of this in Corazine too, which is just up the hill, found in 2009. Discovered near the center of this synagogue, it is believed to be a Moses seat, which either was an honorary seat for the Torah, the Bible, or a place where the reader would sit to teach or read the word. It was for use in worship, far from the temple as we mentioned, and the seven-candle menorah that you see here fits the first century design which means the craftsmen must have seen this prior to 70 AD because after that, the menorah had a different number of candles on it. So this is early. This is very early. What's the biblical significance of this? Well, first of all, the city, the synagogue, and Magdala Stone reinforce several details about his life. As we mentioned, Mary Magdalene was from there. There was a faithful Jewish presence in Galilee where Jesus spent most of his time. By the way, when the Romans came in in about 66 A.D., from 66 to 70 A.D., they killed thousands of people in this town. It was a fishing village. Archaeological detail supports the claim that Pharisees demonstrated their status by sitting in the seat of Moses. So these little details that you find in the dirt, you go, well, this appears to corroborate what the gospel writers are saying. Now we're going to stay in Galilee, but go north to Caesarea Philippi. Who has been to Israel? Has anyone been to Israel? So you've been to Caesarea Philippi, right? There are probably few places in Israel that the location makes more of a difference to understanding what is said than Caesarea Philippi, okay? Caesarea Philippi is where you hear about the gates of hell, and upon this rock I will build my church. We'll get into that here in a minute. Where is it? It's north of the Sea of Galilee. You're getting up toward Lebanon now. And in fact, here's an aerial shot. Here's the Sea of Galilee. Here's Caesarea Philippi, and Mount Hermon's right next to it. Okay, so it's way north. You're getting up toward Dan. That's like the northern city in Israel, the northernmost. And by the way, this is a great website and YouTube channel, holylandsite.com. Holylandsite.com. Dr. Todd Fink, who is a pastor, has gone to just about every site in Israel and done a video on it, including aerial footage and all sorts of stuff. He does a great job describing what's going on. So if you want to go into more depth than what we can do here in this 30,000 feet look, go check out that website. And here, by the way, this is, this is what the site looks like when you go to it, Holy Land site right here, bringing the Bible to life by seeing where it took place. So Caesarea Philippi. Now, do you see this picture here? There's a big hole here. This was supposed to be the access point to hell in the time of Jesus. Now, it didn't look like this then. Why? Because they had all these temples in this area. They had the cave entrance. In front of the cave entrance, they had the Temple of Augustus. Then they had the Court of Pan. What's Pan? Does anyone know what Pan is? It was a god, half goat, half man god, from where we get the, the, the word panic. And people would worship, to, they sacrifice to this god Pan, half goat, half man. You had a temple of Zeus. You had an upper tomb temple, a lower tomb temple. And uh, this gate right here was considered the gate to hell or gate to Hades. And people would sometimes throw their babies in there as sacrifices so they'd have better results with their crops or better results in something they wanted. And so when Jesus comes here and he talks about the gates of hell, he's referencing what everybody in his presence would readily understand. In fact, this would be a modern day Las Vegas of some kind or any city nowadays. So you don't need to. What's Las Vegas. There's gambling. There's, there's, you know, there's a prostitution everywhere now, right? There's all sorts of debauchery going on. 
And when you go there today, I mean, you can walk around the ruins. There's the gates of hell right there. And there's just some debris left behind. But let's look at what Jesus said and Peter, what Jesus asked Peter and how Peter responded. Jesus says, what about you? Who do you say that I am? This is a key question still today. Who do you say that I am? Everyone has to answer that question. If Christianity is true, and I think it is, everyone's eternity is dependent on how you answer that question. Because God's not going to force you into heaven against your will. If you don't want Jesus now, you're not going to want him in eternity. So what does Peter say in response? Well, before we get there, this is also the this is also the area or the place where Jesus says, I gotta go to Jerusalem and and be murdered, basically, be the sacrifice. And what does Peter say? Oh no, Lord, that's not gonna happen to you. What does Jesus say to him? Get behind me, Satan. Now who would have made this up? they're making this up, they're not going to have the Lord call the top apostle at the time Satan. But that's really what happened. And we're kind of like that in America now, right? We're going we're to say we don't want to go through any suffering. We, don't, we shouldn't expect anything to go wrong in our lives. Everything ought to be just right. And that's basically what Peter was saying to Jesus. Oh, Lord, no, nothing bad can happen to you. And he says, get behind me, Satan. You don't have the, the things of God on your mind. So anyway, he asks Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter says this, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And here's what, how Jesus responds. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church in the gates of Hades, will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. There are many interpretations of this passage. Let's talk about the Roman Catholic interpretation. What is the Roman Catholic interpretation of this passage? Anyone know? That Peter is the rock, and that this was Jesus basically saying to Peter, I'm going to build the church upon you. You're the first pope. And then there'll be subsequent popes, obviously. Now, to be fair, papal infallibility did not actually become a real doctrine until about 1860. All right? And papal infallibility doesn't mean everything the pope says is infallible. It only is supposed to mean that whatever he speaks call in, in a way called ex cathedra that he is infallible but he rarely does that and as you can see given the current pope we have he rarely does that <laughs> okay <laughs> in any event um they would think that okay he's the rock and jesus is telling everybody that upon peter he's going to build the church What's the Protestant viewpoint of this passage? Yeah, the, the declaration is the rock, and the rock upon which the church is built is who? It's Christ. And it's not just Peter that has the ability to, to bind on earth and bound in heaven and all this. The other apostles have that ability too as we see elsewhere in scriptures. Also, if you want to look at Peter, he denied Christ three times, as you know. He was rebuked by Paul in Galatians chapter 2. We covered that when we went through the entire book of Galatians. Peter also was married. Now, obviously, all the, this papal stuff came later, but if you're going to say Peter was the first pope, he's certainly not representative of what we think of popes now. Popes aren't married. Popes are people that uh, are not going to deny Christ, right? Uh, popes, when they speak in a certain way, are not going to be fallible. But Peter was all of those things. Also, as I mentioned, the gates of Hades is that cave right there. And by the way, gates are defensive, 
right? They're not offensive. And so what he's saying here is that even in an awful place like Caesarea Philippi, that their defenses are no match for the gospel, ultimately. So even when you think things are awful here in America or wherever you're from, and you say, oh, the gospel's never going to win, the gospel's never going to penetrate, ultimately it will. It doesn't mean everyone's going to be saved because a lot of people don't want to be saved. But the gates of hell are not going to prevail against the kingdom of God. Now here, by the way, if you want clarification on who the rock is, who does Peter say the rock is? For that, why don't we go to Peter? First Peter, he actually wrote this. Here's what Peter says. As you come to him, who's him? Jesus, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood and offer spiritual sacrifices to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. If this was Peter, whoever believes in him, you don't believe in Peter not to be put in shame. He wouldn't be talking this way about himself. He's talking about Jesus here. The rock is Jesus. Now, Part of the problem here is Jesus is sort of using a play on words. Because what does the word Petrus mean? Peter means rock. Actually, it means little pebble. And then there's the rock in front of them, which is Caesarea Philippi, the mountain there. right? So he's using a play on words. But I think this is the better explanation. You can also see Paul talking about this in 1 Corinthians 3.11 and Ephesians 2.20. He's essentially saying the same thing. That the rock, the foundation, is Jesus. And we are being added to the foundation. That's what this is saying here. And that, that's what the church is comprised of. Now there's another problem, however, if you keep reading here in Matthew 16, you read this, Jesus saying this, truly I tell you some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now why is that a problem? When did this happen? Has Jesus come back and we didn't know it? These guys are all dead. How could he say such a thing? Okay, here's the problem. Remember how we talked about before that there are no verses in the Bible? There are no verses in the Bible. When Matthew was writing this, he didn't say, here's Matthew 16, verse 28. When did those chapter and verse divisions get put in? When? About 500 years ago to help us navigate the text. Why? Because it'd be really hard to find your way around this big series of books that we put under one binding if you didn't have numbers, right? I mean, imagine you didn't have numbers in your Bible and your pastor didn't have numbers in his. And one Sunday morning, he got up with this big book and he just opened it up and he looked at you and he said, let's go about two-thirds of the way in. Let's see if we can find the same spot, right? You go, no, you couldn't do that, right? You need numbers to help you find your way around the problem is, we often think if it's got a number in front of it, we can take it out and make it say whatever we want. And we often stop at the end of a chapter because we think, oh, the thought is done. There's no sense going any further. This is where these guys 500 years ago decided that the chapter ends, so the thought has ended. Has the thought ended? Here is the next verse. This is Matthew 16, 28. Here's Matthew 17, 1. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. He's talking about the transfiguration. Remember how important it is to also know where this is happening? Remember where Caesarea Philippi? Right next to Mount Hermon. 
That's probably where the transfiguration took place. And by the way, if you read any Michael Heiser, an Old Testament scholar who, great guy, just passed away about a year ago, but he talks about, I think one of his books is called Reversing Hermon, because that's where demonic, a lot of demonic activity was. So why does Jesus go to Hermon to transfigure himself, to show the kingdom of God? Some of these people will not taste death until they see the... And then here, here they are. They're right here. But what people do is they stop reading. Oh, 17. There's a whole new thought, a whole new thing going on here. No, just keep going. It's right there. By the way, who's still alive? Moses and Elijah. This is why when Jesus goes after the Sadducees, and by the way, they're called Sadducees because they didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they were Sadducee. These are like terrible theological dad jokes, all right? <laughs> but when Jesus tries to correct the Sadducees about, because they didn't believe in a resurrection, they didn't, they didn't think there was an afterlife, the way he corrects them is he doesn't quote from Old Testament passages that actually talk about a resurrection like Isaiah or Daniel. He quotes from the Torah where I think it's in Exodus 3, he says that Yahweh is the God of the living. How can he be a God of the living if everyone who's dead is dead and there's no afterlife? He can't be. But he says that Abraham, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the God. Those guys are still alive? Yeah, they're still alive. Not here. But they're still alive, just like Moses and Elijah are. They're still alive. So knowing the geography, knowing what's going on in the area can help you understand what's going on in the text. All right? There's a lot more in Caesarea Philippi we don't have time to get into. Let's talk about at least one more, and that is the Pool of Bethesda. Now we're going down to Jerusalem. Okay, we're going up from way up in the north. We're going all the way down to Jerusalem. By the way, Jesus does all of his miracles outside of Jerusalem except three. The resurrection's the biggest, right? What are the other two? What are the two miracles other than the resurrection Jesus does in Jerusalem? Here's one of them. He heals a lame man. Who else does he heal in Jerusalem? Blind man. Both have to do with pools. It's Pool of Bethesda, Pool of Siloam, we'll get to. Notice when, and I don't know if there's a connection here, but it's interesting. When David is trying to take Jerusalem from the Jebusites, they're up in this big tower looking down at David and his men going, this place is so well fortified that we can defend it. Even if we were lame and blind, we could defend this place. And how does David take it, by the way? He sends one of his generals up a water shaft. And that's how they take the fortress, which is in the city of David still today, this fortress. But notice, David takes the city when the Jebusites are saying, even the blind and the lame can defend this place. And the two miracles he does, healing a blind man, healing a lame man in the neighborhood. Don't know if there's a connection. I just find it interesting. In any event, does this look like a pool to you? Doesn't look like a pool to me, but we'll get there. Let's read the passage first. In Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. When Jesus saw a lame man lying there, he asked him, do you want to get well, sir? The invalid replied, I have no one, no one to help me get in the pool when the water is stirred. They thought when the water was stirred, if you got in the pool first, you might get healed. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. This is John chapter 5. 
Okay, now where is this? We're in Jerusalem now. Here's an aerial view. We're looking to the north, obviously the Dome of the Rock. This is where the temple was in Jesus' day. If you go to the north, near the Lion's Gate, and many think there's a gate right here called the Sheep Gate. Why would it be called the Sheep Gate? Because they would bring sheep in to be sacrificed at the temple. And one of these pools may have been used for sheep at one point. In any event, here's the Pool of Bethesda. And St. Anne's Church is right next to it. Now, this place has the world's best acoustics. When you go into St. Anne's Church, everybody who is there gets up on the stage there and we sing. And you could have the worst voice in the world. When you get all the people singing like a hymn together, it sounds angelic. I don't know how it works. But this St. Anne's Church is a church built on the spot that tradition says St. Anne, who was the mother of Mary, that's where she lived, okay? So this is just outside the gate, St. Anne's Church, and right next to it, discovered in the 1800s, is the Pool of Bethesda. Now, what about this place? First of all, this is from Biblical Archaeological Society. When Jesus heals the paralytic in the Gospel of John, the Bethesda pool is described as having five porticos or five porches. Now, this baffled people. How can a pool have five? You've got four, right? If it's a big triangle, I mean, sorry, big uh, rectangle or square, it would have four, not five. A puzzling feature suggesting an unusual five-sided pool, which most Scholars dismissed as unhistorical literary creation. Yet, when this site was excavated, it revealed a rectangular pool with two basins separated by a wall, thus a five-sided pool, and each side had a portico. It probably looked like something like this. So this is a picture. If you go to the Israel Museum in Jerusalem, back uh, several decades ago, they designed what they thought Jerusalem looked like in the first century. And this is a picture of what they thought the Pool of Bethesda looked like. There was an upper pool, a northern pool, and a lower pool, a southern pool. And this was the fifth side, the portico in the middle, the, the porch in the middle. And they thought that this pool, the northern pool, archaeologically fed the southern pool with, with fresh water. And they thought this was a mikvah, which is a uh, ritual cleansing pool where you would go before you went to the temple. You had to ritually clean yourself so you'd go into this pool. And then you could go right through the sheep gate to the temple. It's just a few hundred yards away. And so there was a little dam here that the water would come down into. Now, when you go there today... And you're right outside St. Anne's Church. Many of you have been there. You've got this railing there. And you kind of look down at this and you go, like you see these railings here everywhere. Like you can walk through here. You can go down into it. But St. Anne's Church, if you're standing right here, St. Anne's Church is right over here. And you're looking down and you're going, this, this doesn't look like a pool, does it? No, of course it doesn't. Why not? What did, what did they do whenever they found an historical site? They build a church on it, right? That's what, that's what you're looking at. You're looking at a church, and this is probably the best orientation of what you're looking at. First of all, the Church of St. Anne is here, and we were just standing right here looking down there. Well, here's the northern pool. Here's the southern pool. And the northern pool, they think, was 700 B.C. The southern pool, about 200 B.C., the healing baths that were here in about 100 B.C., the Roman temple, 135 A.D. What, what Roman temple? Hadrian, 2nd century Roman emperor, the guy that named Palestine, Palestine, the guy that tried to cover up where Jesus was buried and resurrected by putting pagan We'll see this next time by putting a, a pagan shrine there. The guy that tried to cover up where Jesus was born in Bethlehem, we already talked about that, by putting a pagan shrine there, a grove of trees there. He tried to do the same thing here. He tried to say that, no, this 
was going to be a place where you could get healed by the Greek and Roman god Asclepius. And I'll tell you what Asclepius here here in just a minute. By the way, if he's building a pagan shrine to healing at this site, what's he implicitly admitting? Healing went on there. And if he's trying to get people off Jesus as being the healer and Asclepius as really being the healer, he goes to the spot where Christians would have gone and he says, now this is a shrine to Asclepius. And so you've got a Byzantine basilica here. You've got a crusader chapel. You've got the Church of St. Anne from 138 A.D. And what you're looking at, this is the visible part of the pool, the church and this other area, these were churches that they put in in this area. Why? Because all the way back to the events itself, people knew that this is where Jesus healed the blind man. In fact, Asclepius, he's the Greek and Roman god of medicine. Notice he has a staff. What's on the staff? Notice anything familiar? We still use the snake. In our medical associations, even Blue Cross Blue Shield, what's that? Some say, in fact, Titus Kennedy said, this could also be, other than Asclepius, it could be the snake that people had to look to in the wilderness when Moses held up the snake. And notice how Jesus refers to that. He says, the Son of Man must be lifted up. That's not a metaphor for, oh, we have to praise the Son of Man? No. It's actually he's saying that he's going to be lifted up on a cross. So this is probably from Asclepius and or the snake that Moses had to hold up so the Jews could be saved from the snake bites. You remember that from the Old Testament. All right. That's even further back. Yeah, this is, this is out in the wilderness. All right. So when you find the pool of Bethesda, and by the way, for those of you that have uh, John chapter 5, who has John chapter 5? If you go to John chapter 5, it might be verse 1 or it might be verse 2. It says there is a pool called Bethesda in Jerusalem. Now, a lot of people, a lot of scholars, probably a majority of scholars today will say that John was written in 90 or 95 A.D. Would he say there is a pool called Bethesda in Jerusalem in 90 or 95 A.D.? Why, why would he say that? What happened in 70 A.D.? The whole city was wiped out. This is why Dr. Dan Wallace, who is one of the top manuscript scholars in the world, recently retired from Dallas Theological Seminary. A number of years ago, I had him on our podcast, and I asked him, when do you think the Gospel of John was written? Because according to this, it would seem it had to have been written prior to 70 A.D. Otherwise, he wouldn't say there is a pool called Bethesda in Jerusalem. That would have been wiped out. And Dr. Dan Wallace said, well, actually, Frank, he said about 25 years ago, I did, I spent a year researching that, and I came to the conclusion that John was written prior to 70 A.D. By the way, Revelation is written as if the temple's still standing, too, isn't it? Revelation, I think, was written prior to 70 A.D. as well. Now, could I be wrong? Of course. It's speculative, but it seems like the evidence is pointing in that direction. Now, there's another pool, Pool Asylum, but we don't have time to get to it tonight. That's where Jesus' other healing in Jerusalem took place. And uh, we'll talk about it next time. Whereas the Pool of Bethesda is up here, the Pool of Siloam is all the way down at the bottom of the city of David. And the great Eli Shukran, our guide who leads us when we go to Israel, discovered it. But we'll talk about that next time. 
and we'll review what we did here next time. Uh, we'll, we'll review all this stuff next time. We don't have time to, to go any further. So questions, comments? How is Elvis Dupron doing? He's in Montana right now. Oh, really? Yeah, I don't know why he's in Montana. I just saw a Facebook post. He got out of Dodge, I guess. I don't yeah, know. Exactly. <laughs> so he was supposed to be visiting somebody there. And, uh, but in any event, by the way, for those of you that want to go further in all this, and I hope you do, get any one of Titus's books, Unearthing the Bible, Excavating the Evidence for Jesus, or The Essential Archaeological, Archaeological Guide to Bible Lands. Any of those would be great. All right. Troy. Oh, we need a mic because for the people out there, and anybody out there wants to ask a question, just put in big block letters on YouTube a uh, question, and we'll see if we can get there. Go ahead. You had mentioned about the census being in 4 B.C. Why wouldn't – did you go over this last time? Why wouldn't it be in 1 A.D.? Jesus wasn't oh, born in well, AD. Be because a monk in the Middle Ages just got the calendar wrong. That's all. Oh. <laughs> so we, he okay. was about four years off. Oh. I don't know why he got off or how he got off, but that's what I've read about it, that he was actually four years off. And so in reality, the millennium occurred in 1996. <laughs> okay. The second millennium. <laughs> That monk had Cast into the third, yeah, some monk. sure so. mess things up. All right, anyone else? <coughs> yes, yes, sir. Yeah, just if you don't mind using the mic because we're on uh, YouTube as well. Uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Yes, sir. It should be on. No, you're not, it's not going to amplify. It's for the uh, audience out there. Can I ask a question about your campus uh, presentations, your ministries there? Um, tomorrow, uh, Dr. James Anderson at RTS, who's a professor of theology and philosophy, he's giving a presentation on the changing landscape of campus apologetics. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious uh, what you have seen over the last decade or even more than that as a change that you've seen how the conversation has changed on uh, secular campuses as far as apologetics? Yes, uh, a decade or more ago, the new atheism was much more popular. You know, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, uh, Sam Harris, Daniel Dennett, those kind of guys. That's kind of faded away now. Um, however, the campus is less open to Christianity, the administration is. I'm not saying all the students are. In fact, I think we get fewer requests for campus now than we did 10 years ago because even Christian groups are afraid to do anything that could be even mildly provocative. Like, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. In fact, way back in 2011, we went to Stanford University and Stanford even in 2011, was more, I guess, liberal than even other universities at the time. And they didn't want to use the title, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. That might offend somebody. So we had to change it to like, you know, is Christianity true or evidence Christianity is true or something like that. So uh, what has changed in terms of the questions and the objections that are brought up the top three objections now to Christianity are morality, morality, and morality. Everything's about morality now and justice and all these things. Ironically, though, the people who are opposed to these things often are atheists and they have no grounds for morality outside of themselves. It's just their opinion. I mean, if you really want true justice, you've got to believe in God because without God, there is no justice or injustice. There is no purpose to life, so there's no right way to live it, no wrong way to live it. Things just happen. Uh, it's survival of the fittest. So if you're crying out for justice out there, you ought to believe in God because God is the only one that can be the standard by which we would even know what justice was and the only one that can actually have secured justice in the end. Only an all-knowing being who can know what people will do and, or have done and should have done, can right all wrongs in the end. Go ahead. So a follow-up question to that would be, what have you found to be the most effective way to communicate 
uh, the gospel to that kind of cynicism. Uh, that well, cynics are hard to deal with because they don't want it to be true. But I always just ask the question, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? And that cuts away all of the other reasons why people don't believe. It just says, is this an evidence problem it, or is this really a heart problem? And 99 times out of 10, it's a heart problem. It's not an evidence problem. And that's why they try to take the high ground on morality so that they can justify their position over a God that they would be accountable to. Sure. If, if you've noticed, in uh, certainly more in recent years, there's a lot more talk about uh, oppression and oppressor and oppressed groups and Christianity being toxic. That's what this whole deconstruction movement is about. And so many people are talking about how Oh, well, if this is in any way damaging to my psyche, it's wrong. And so they're actually pushing people out of their lives who may be Christians because these people are toxic. This is the whole new deconstruction movement. And basically where that stems from, I think, is the idea that the human individual is the center of the universe and there's no authority outside that outside of us, so we just get to make up our own truth, and we get to make up our own uh, meaning of life, and how can you say I'm wrong if there is no standard outside of myself, and so you need to respect what my feelings are, and I get to follow my feelings, and you're wrong if you tell me that I, I can't do that. It's basically what, we, what we've created is a narcissistic culture, that everyone is their own little god. And the worst sin is to judge somebody or to say that somebody is doing something wrong. They're actually claiming it's wrong to say someone is wrong. Do you see the irony here? Mm -hmm. In fact, there's a new book out. I haven't read it yet, but uh, people that I work with have by Abigail Schreier. Do you know who Abigail Schreier is? Abigail Schreier is the lady, not a Christian, but she wrote a book four years ago called Irreversible Damage, How the Transgender Craze is Seducing Our Daughters. Well, she just wrote a new book I haven't gotten to yet, but it's called Bad Therapy. And it's about how people try and pathologize everything. Like if you're a kid, well, let me ask you guys who are a little bit older in here. 30, 40 years ago, if your kid got out of line, what would you say? Knock it off, right? Do I need to come back there and smack a couple of heads together? Now... They'll say, oh, my kid has a condition. My kid has to get therapy. It's, it, it, it's not a moral issue anymore. It's some, some kind of psychosis where the kid has ADD. I'm not saying maybe that's not a real diagnosis for some kids, but it's like every kid has ADD. No, every kid's a kid. <laughs> so we're going to medicate these kids. It's not a moral issue. It's some, some sort of medical, pathological issue that needs to be treated rather than you need to say to them, kid, you need to start behaving better. And that's what this book, Bad Therapy, is all about. Everything is centered on the individual, and the kid is never wrong. The kid just might need medicine, or the kid might need therapy of some kind. Go ahead, Gary. Before I get to my question, I think I've heard you say, uh, make the analogy of a, bulim a child with bulimia. You know, you, uh, this isn't something you do surgery or give yeah, anything anorexia, else. Yeah, anorexia, yeah. Yeah, anorexia, right, yeah. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. So it's beautiful. Um, I'm curious about Capernaum. Um, what you showed on the pictures there were, uh, uh, that was great, but is Capernaum still a modern city? Is there still things there? Or? No. No, really? No, okay. no. It, it's, I mean, there's two areas of Capernaum. One is 90% of Capernaum you see in, say, uh, this picture. Mm. But there's another area off to the side here, where I think the Franciscan zone. But no, it's not. There's one thing that the Israelis have done really well is they haven't commercialized the Sea of Galilee very much. I mean, there are hotels, don't get me wrong. Tiberius is just to the south there. But places like this, Capernaum, Bethsaida, Magdala, they're not building on them. 
they know that that's, maybe they're being reverent or maybe they also know they, they don't want to kill the golden goose of tourism, <laughs> okay? And so the Sea of Galilee is pretty peaceful, pretty calm. Um, there's not a lot of, not a lot of uh, in industry in that area. And so when you go there, you go, wow, this is uh, pretty rustic. It's kind of like going to Corinth. Corinth is the same way. There's no town <laughs> built on Corinth, on ancient Corinth. You're, you're standing right where the Apostle Paul stood in Corinth. Now, you go to Athens, obviously. While the ruins are still there, Athens is, you know, Paul was in Athens in Acts 17, but it's, it's a modern city, too. It's an ancient city inside of a modern city. You know, there are areas that, are obviously, the Acropolis and Mars Hill and all that, but when you're out in Corinth, when you're out in Capernaum or Bethsaida, it's, it's pretty quiet. Yeah. Anybody from online? What do we got? Uh, we got Doug asked, uh, what event does day one year, like 1 AD, uh, start with? Like, is it Christ's birth or his death, something else? If we aren't sure, could that be why we aren't positive what census Luke is referring to? No, we think we know the, because the census, once they figured out the true dating, the census was still 6 AD. So the census that Josephus is talking about, the census that Luke is talking about appears to be 8 BC which would take several years to carry out, so 4 B.C. fits right in there, that Jesus uh, was born and then his family ultimately had to go to uh, Bethlehem. All right, anybody else? Uh, yeah, last one, kind of on the same subject. Um, when did historians first start keeping track of our modern time? Was it year 1 A.D., year 33 A.D., 50 A.D., some other time? I don't know when the dating. I think it was in the Middle Ages. I don't know the exact date. But, you know, you used to date. In fact, Luke. What does Luke say in Luke chapter 3? He says, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Itria and, Tracto uh, and Tractonicus, and Licinius, Tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priest of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. Now, in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, when was that? Probably about 29 A.D., because he came to power in 14 A.D. So, even Luke is using reigns to date the 15th year, the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Um, and all those other people, and we'll get to this in the next lesson or the lesson after that, all those people that Luke mentions in Luke chapter 3, verse, the reason I know that is because we, when we go to college campuses, we often quote that passage. Um, all those people that Luke mentions lived at that exact time doing exactly what Luke says they were doing. So it's not a once upon a time story. He's telling us by the reign of Tiberius Caesar what year it was that we now, we now would call 29 AD. It depends on whether you count the first year. It could be 28 AD, you know, but in that time frame. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Do you think God purposely hid or destroyed certain archaeologists archaeological evidence so we wouldn't venerate it? That's speculation. How do we know? Yeah, I, I have no idea whether God decided he didn't want us to venerate certain things. That could be the case with the autographs of Scripture, right? It, like, say Paul writes the Book of Romans, and we have the scroll that Paul wrote the Book of Romans on. Well, if someone had the scroll, not only might we venerate it, but you could change it, right? But... If the book of Romans, the original is lost, and it's spread all over the ancient world, and we can reconstruct the original by comparing all those different copies, you could protect the word better than if there was one original copy. Because you could just compare all the copies and figure out who the outliers were. Well, Brent, he changed his copy. I can see where he changed his. Or, 
Greg changed this over here because look, all these other versions say the same thing and they differ from what Greg's version was, right? You can reconstruct the original or preserve the original better than if you just had one version, the original version. So that's a possibility, but it's speculation. In fact, sometimes when you get a question, why would God do or why did God do? If he doesn't explain himself, all we can say, well, we're speculating here. Those are, those are uncertain answers, quite obviously. All right, let's go over here to Brent, who changed his copy right over here. That's right. I brought you into it. Now he's going to defend himself. I did not change my copy of Romans. Go ahead. Just looking at the, uh, the Capernaum and, and the other photographs from the air, it, it's made me just kind of think, what was this? And you mentioned how Israel has done a very good job not mm -hmm. developing over this land. Mm -hmm. Is this stuff that's been really found and recovered since the birth of the, the, the recent nation of Israel? Some stuff has been found. But there are pilgrims that went to Capernaum back in the 300s, back in the 600s, and we have their records. So it's not just uh, recent discoveries, although we had up here, what, 1968? Why 1968? Where was it? I think we had 1968 in here. When did Israel come back into the land? 1948. Okay, so 20 years later, they sent... Um, some archaeologists up there. Here it is, 1968, right? Uh, in fact, uh, one of the previous lessons, we pointed out that when they found, I think it's called the burnt house in the city of David, they had discovered something just after they got access to that area of Jerusalem, after the war of 1967. It's so like 1968, they discovered, oh, we can go in there and look at this stuff. Yeah, so. I thought about that with the missiles flying over yeah, this yeah. weekend. Right. These targets, you know, these are things that could be taken out. And by the way, yeah. to be fair, Muslims don't want this stuff blown up either. Particularly not the Temple Mount. What's on the Temple Mount? The Dome of the Rock. The Alaska Mosque. Right? Most Muslims don't want that to blow up. Well, yeah, this is, this, this is Capernaum here. But, well, who knows? I mean, Hezbollah has missiles in the north. If you keep going up near Caesarea Philippi, a little further north of that, they got all these missiles aimed at Israel. Could they overwhelm the, the Iron Dome? Yeah, if they sent them all at once, probably, right? But they know that those people there in Lebanon can be invaded. You, you can't really invade Iran. You could invade Lebanon. They the, the, the Israelites have done that. They've gone into Lebanon. Eli Shukran was one of the guys that went into Lebanon in 1981. They all had to do at least two years of service. Yeah, yeah, they all, they all serve. Let's go back over here. Go ahead, Gary. More speculation, sorry. But... You made a great point. So in, in the 100 years, let's say, or, or so or less that Israel's had this land, they've not wanted to do anything with it or pres they wanted mm -hmm. to preserve it. What about the time before that? I would think somebody might have done something. Well, remember, prior to Israel, you had the British from about 1917 to about 1948. Prior to that, you had the Ottoman Empire for about 400 years. Prior to that, you had, gee, you'd have to go back now. I'm trying to go backwards in memory. But different people ruled the land. Generally, it's pretty rustic still, though. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, and archaeology is a relatively new endeavor. It's only about 200 years old. It's not like people dug stuff up in 1500, okay? They were too busy just trying to live than to figure out what went on before them. In well, terms I, I guess of I was just, just thinking there wouldn't even be another settlement like Lake Norman. This is Lake Norman. Why oh, would one, yeah. Know, why isn't someone else building a house there? Right. Well, there were several fishing ports that people could. Maybe they did have. I don't know if anyone ever lived in these areas. You know, the basalt areas. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't. I don't know if that if that has happened 
or not? Well, Frank, you yeah. remember, Frank, that uh, Jesus, I mean, probably to say cursed was probably too strong of a word, but he did say, woe to you, Chorus, and woe to you, mm -hmm. Capernaum. So he, he essentially prophesied that you're going to get you know, you're going to get torn down and ripped and nobody's ever going to build on you again. And that's actually happened. Those 10 cities have, have been, that's happened to them. Yeah, you, that might be the case with this too. I mean, he's really talking about the day of judgment, but also there were, there were at least two, maybe three major earthquakes in this area uh, over uh, the past several hundred years or actually in the first millennium. There were several earthquakes that may have prevented people from really settling there. But look, how many people lived in the area? You know, this, this is still up in the rural north. It's not Jerusalem. And Jerusalem at the time of Jesus maybe had sixty to 100,000 people in a, in a smaller area than our cities. But that's not a ton of people. All right? All right. Thanks for watching out there, folks.